I think building an extra rest is important, but I think that you've got to have a bit of a, a build up to get the benefit from the extra rest. Like if you did two weeks on, two weeks off, two weeks on, two weeks off, would it have the same effect as nine weeks on, two weeks off? I, I have no idea, but it's a really cool thought process. Welcome to Corporate Warrior, the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health, optimize performance, and maximize productivity. With your host, Lawrence Neal. This podcast is brought to you by HitUni.com. HitUni.com are a provider of amazing online courses for high intensity training qualifications. HitUni comes highly recommended by the best in the field, including Body by Science co author Dr. Doug McGuff, Discover Strength CEO Luke Carlson, and trainer and founder of Bay.com, Drew Bay. It was founded by my friend, author, and longtime personal trainer Simon Shawcross, who's also been a guest on the podcast. Simon has 15 years' experience training clients and has supervised over 15. 15,000 high intensity training workouts. Using knowledge from experts like Skylar Tanner, Dr. James Steele, Dr. Ellington Darden, Hit Uni is a goldmine for learning everything to do with high intensity training. The courses are delivered online through the website where you can learn via a variety of multimedia materials at your own pace. There's online support and a discussion forum where you can share ideas and ask for help. To learn more about high-intensity training and improve my own results, I started their personal trainer course. The content is amazing, the courses are really easy to follow, and each section is organized into bite-sized chunks that give you a real sense of achievement after you complete each one. I should also mention there is a DIY course. So this is the course for you if you're not necessarily a personal trainer, but you want to learn more about high-intensity training and how to implement it for maximum benefit in your own exercise regime. To get your exclusive Corporate Warrior 10% discount on any course you purchase, simply head on over to hituni.com, that's H-I-T-U-N-I dot com, and enter the coupon code CW10, that's CW in the number 10. So again, head on over to hituni.com, pick your course, and enter the coupon code CW10 for 10% discount. Thank you for your support. This episode is brought to you by Health IQ, a life insurance company that helps health conscious people like runners, cyclists, weightlifters, high intensity training participants, and more get a lower rate on their life insurance. Go to healthiq.com forward slash C warrior to support the show and see if you qualify. If you take care of yourself, you do smart strength training, you eat well, and your life insurance company doesn't seem like they care, there's an answer for you. Health IQ actually gives savings to people who take care of themselves. About 56 percent of health iq customers say between four and 33 percent on their life insurance because of this health iq customers can save up to a third because physically active people have a 56 percent lower risk of heart disease 20 percent lower risk of cancer and 58 percent lower risk of diabetes compared to people that are inactive but your life insurance company probably just doesn't care you care and there are companies out there that care to see if you qualify, get your free quote today at healthiq.com forward slash warrior, or mention the promo code CWARRIOR when you talk to a Health IQ agent. Hey guys, I am Lawrence Neal and welcome to another episode of Corporate Warrior, the podcast that teaches you how to optimize your high intensity training workouts, maximum gains, and how to start and grow your strength training business. My former guests include HIT experts like Dr. Doug McGuff and Drew Bay, paleo pioneers Mark Sisson and Rob Wolf, Zero Carb Carnival, Dr. Sean Baker, diet and metabolism experts, successful strength training entrepreneurs, time management gurus, high intensity training bodybuilders and everything in between. My next guest is my friend and owner of Menex Precision Fitness, Blair Wilson. Early on in Blair's training career, he developed a close relationship with John Little, who's been on the podcast multiple times. John became Blair's mentor and introduced him to the concepts of high-intensity training. Blair then had a career as a professional water skier in Australia, but was still very much interested in high-intensity training, and eventually he decided to return to Canada to start his own high-intensity training business. Since my first interview with Blair back in March 2017, his business has really took off. He's completely maxed out of clients, and it just shows how much opportunity there is for strength training businesses, so long as you are driven to make it a successful business yourself. 
Uh, recently, Blair shared some really interesting findings with me. He's been tracking his clients' progress using his bod pod, and he's noticed that in multiple cases, long layoffs from training have actually produced greater gains in muscle mass for both himself and his clients. This certainly makes the argument that it may serve you well to take a couple of weeks off every few months or so. And furthermore, during the resistance exercise conference, Dr. James Fisher presented some data that showed no difference in hypertrophy between a group that did continuous resistance training versus a group that took a few weeks off. So maybe we should be convo- sorry, cultivating uh, less training angst and taking a couple of weeks off every now and again. Um, psychologically and I'm sure you can probably relate to this I personally find this really hard because my mind starts playing tricks on me and I start to think I'm losing muscle if I don't train frequently enough Um, but in reality this is probably just in my head uh, and it's more likely the opposite and for all the show notes and links for this episode and all episodes, please go to corporatewarrior.org. Don't forget to hang around at the end for your free gift from me. And now I give you MedEx Precision Fitness owner Blair Wilson on taking breaks from strength training. Blair, welcome back to Corporate Warrior. Thanks for having me, pal. It's a pleasure, as always. Um, you know, we were we were on Facebook recently talking about um, what's going on in your business. Uh, recently and yep. you you talked about this new thing which is really innovative called rest um which i don't think i've heard before <laughs> yeah it's a four-letter word to some yeah and it's uh i think it's something that some of us keynotes struggle to uh, get enough of so do you want to tell me about what your findings have been um uh, with some of this this uh prolonged rest experimentation you've been doing in your facility with your clients yeah, so I've got a group of keen people who are, we'll, we'll say trained trainees, which I think is really important. Like these people have been with me for over two years, in some cases over five years. And I don't think we can extrapolate the same level of conviction and conversation with people that are newer, right? First 12 months, under two years kinds of thing. But we have a bod pod in our facility and um, I've convinced a couple people to use it, couple probably a handful, 10, maybe 12, to use it on a really regular basis just for the sake of getting data. And I have no clue what I do with most of this data most of the time, but I was like, I kept seeing trends pop up where people would go through 9, 10, 11, 12 weeks of consistent training, working hard, getting better every time. Like not, not like really suffering through their workouts. Every once in a while you get a set that ends a little short or whatever. You have your blips on the radar. But for the most part, for the whole 10 or 12 weeks, they'd get stronger on everything. And they'd be feeling great. And there'd be no indication really that they'd be slowing down. But at the end of – they would have gone in the bod pot at the start 10 or 12 weeks later just to check in. They'd go in again and they would have less lean mass. They'd have less muscle mass, even though they got stronger over the whole time. And it kept happening, and I didn't really know what the heck was going on. I would chalk it up to hydration, perhaps poor sleep, maybe some questionable dietary considerations. But for the most part, I really control the variables of which we do the reading in. So I try to do it, like make them do it always around the same time of day rarely in the afternoon. It's a temperature controlled environment. The bod pod gets calibrated all the time. And I finally like clicked one day, and this is probably two years ago where I was like, what, like, don't, don't work out today. Like, let's see what the heck's going on. And this is with one of my keeners that's been with me for four or five years. I was like, come back next week and let's, let's like see if what, what happens if you just take the 10 days off and, or two weeks off. Sure enough, it was substantially higher. Their lean mass reading was substantially higher. And there are a whole bunch, and I completely understand this, a whole bunch of contextualized things that have to be taken into consideration, right? What you ate, what else you did. Um, I think even time of year probably influences this. But for the most part, the readings are done at the same time of day on an empty stomach first thing in the morning while having like one glass of water and the room is 26 degrees Celsius. So 
there's only so many variables you can actually account for and as long as you recognize the other ones. But for the sake of comparison, we replicate the event as best we can, which helps us draw conclusions. So if you get stronger, 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 stronger for 12 weeks, but your muscle mass registers a little bit less in the same testing environment and you take a week off and your muscle mass is now higher, it kind of tells me the rest is important. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Um, so I started doing that with a group of, we don't charge our clients for use of the bod pod. It's like a tool that we encourage everybody to utilize uh, for a couple of reasons. It's good data for them, right? It provides accountability and all that kind of stuff, but it also validates our training methodology because I can't influence its result. So if you come in and do what we ask of you, uh, read between the lines, tell you to do, um, and you see a benefit from the bod pod, we like, it's hard to argue that our method doesn't work. Whereas also it gives the client the opportunity to try something knowing that we're not just pulling a blanket over their eyes and selling them snake oil. If that makes any sense. It does. So it does. It's, it's a really cool tool and we encourage everybody to use it. But I have found also in the last eight years that people really love the appearance of being accountable not necessarily being accountable. So having devices like that provides a layer of accountability that kind of gives them a little bit of a break from having to carry themselves through the whole process and just being accountable to their own brain. So if you've got a trainer and you've got a bod pod, you're going to be a little bit more accountable than if you were just on your own, which I think makes sense too. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a trend we've been seeing for a long time. And I, I, again, like I said before, I don't necessarily like to use myself as an anecdote for my clients, but I've been noticing, I have, I've luckily had use of this pod for well over 10 years and I have data going back for 10 years. So I can see these trends in my readings too, which is pretty cool. So how is this, um, affected your recommendations with your clients? Is this now going to be a standard thing like eight weeks on two weeks off or something like that? I haven't figured that out yet. And the people, one of the guys that I was just referring to, he's on a really strict um, eight or nine weeks on, two weeks off kind of thing. And that works really, really well. We consistently will do a bod pod, train for eight weeks, do a bod pod, take two weeks off and do a bod pod. And there's always some level of improvement, which is super cool. In lean mass. In lean mass, yeah. Now, it's going to depend too on because he's been with me for so long what his goals then are so if he's trying to actively lose a bunch of body fat you might not notice an actualization in lean muscle gain um, but what you definitely notice is the fact that he doesn't lose any while he's losing body fat so he's not necessarily recomping losing and gaining although it has happened and might continue to happen but you'll notice either a leveling out or a gain after rest for sure i've never seen anybody get worse after two weeks of rest mm. ever and that's including strength gains in all honesty i've never seen anybody get weaker after two weeks off either that's a strange one that second one because um some would argue that well you know a lot of the strength aspect is skill based right so like if you take a chest press for example like a medics chest press that you might lose that skill element after that period of time um, Absolutely. but you're saying that you don't see a decline in people's performance on like the quick, the medic stuff that you're using, I suppose. So I, I mean, I, I hate saying this, but it's super important. Context matters, right? If you have only been to my facility six times and then you go away on vacation for three weeks, are you going to lose skill? Probably. If you've been practicing that skill on a fairly consistent basis over three years and you leave for two weeks, is that going to have as big of an impact as if you had just started? So we have clients that are with us for a majority of the year, but go south to where it's warm because they're smarter than we are. And uh, they'll be gone for three months and we'll put their weight down X number of percent, very small percent, but more so as a precaution to not freak them out just in case they forgot how hard they're capable of working safely. That's and fun. that weight will bounce back up within two exposures. 
and they've been gone for three months. But it depends on the level of intensity that you leave at and the duration of which you've been practicing. So and there's the your client, the client themselves, and there's a bunch of variables, isn't there? There's a whole ton of them. So, um, okay, going back to the Bob Pod example, this is really interesting. So I guess the other question I have, and I know context is really important. That's why we have to we have to explore that. Um, yeah. You know. Are these are these people that are doing that? You know, you may, you said they're they're keeners, which are, I love that word. I'm stealing that. Um, but do they do they uh, does that mean that they've been training for a long period of time? Therefore, they probably capped out most of their gains and they're just kind of incremental gains from here on out. Or are these people that are in the midst of those kind of that first sort of one or two years of training where they're likely to get better gains anyway? Right. Good question. Super important to consider. All the people I'll refer to today are people that are trained. 100% of these people are um, trained people. And when I say trained, I mean, they've been with me for more than three years, which is super cool. Now, not one of them works out as a profession. Um, All of them work out for health-based considerations. Some of them have lean muscle mass goals. Most of them have longevity goals. And I think somebody who sits down and attempts to achieve their genetic potential can do it in a relatively short period of time. But somebody who's not necessarily focused on achieving their genetic potential, but just continual progression and betterment and instilling those gains from a day-to-day perspective might take three years to actualize their genetic potential. They might take four years. Because like, uh, they might but, not be as consistent or trained with as much intensity, are you thinking? Or? That too, but then think about all the other things that go into actualizing that okay. potential. Okay. You've got nutrition, you've got sleep, you've got stress, you've got alcohol considerations, you've got all of these other variables that let's, like somebody isn't a, I'm going to say gym rat, for lack of a better term and not in a derogatory sense of the word, but if you work out for your health and not the purpose of actualizing your genetic potential, it kind of makes sense that that might take a little bit longer. And I think that's completely fine. Absolutely. Um, All of these people enjoy training. I think that's safe to say they keep coming back, (laughs) but I think there are a couple of circumstances in which those gains are going to be incremental. And then I think there are a couple of like circumstances where these people still have some headroom to achieve and they're going to keep going. And when we build in extra rest, they make bigger steps forward than if we don't build in extra rest. So I think, and this, this conversation is super cool because I'm not trying to prove that I have the answer to this. So I can speak a little more freely, which is really, really awesome. I don't have to worry about saying the wrong thing, but I think building an extra rest is important, but I think that, you've got to have a bit of a, a buildup to get the benefit from the extra rest. Like if you did two weeks on, two weeks off, two weeks on, two weeks off, would it have the same effect as nine weeks on, two weeks off? I, I have no idea. Mm. But it's a really cool thought process. It is because I, I can imagine, and I get a little bit confused about this, and I think a lot of my listeners get a little bit confused because one day I do an episode where the guest is like, yeah, train once a week and every or every ten days, and you'll get maximal gains. And then I have someone like Menno Henselman's come on who says you got to train every day. <laughs> so it's like it's a bit confusing. Um, so, but I, I think what your last point there makes a lot of sense. So you you almost crank it up for, or, or you have I say crank it up. You have a you train fairly consistently. Maybe that's once or twice a week for a period of say eight to ten weeks, and then maybe you cycle off and have a rest of say once two weeks or two weeks off and then back on again. Uh, that sounds like that could be a good N equals one. Like uh, it's a wicked N equals one. And and that N equals one can, you know, it doesn't, you know, we always think black and white once a week or twice a week or take two weeks off. Like that could be 10 days. It could be nine days instead of six days. It, it's just extra rest. So if you're on a frequency of once every seven days, every once in a while, take nine days off. It doesn't have to be a full two weeks. And I think we are spoiled rotten because we have a bod pod right beside the gym. So that's a little bit unfair. But if we had just went by people's strength gains and how they feel, those are pretty crappy markers because they're so subjective. Like how you feel is a terrible way of 
going about a pursuit like that because you could have a bad sleep and feel poor but still have a good workout so i'm not too sure about that and then you take somebody like meno who's uh, the guy's physique is crazy and his tolerance is higher but does he get the same benefit from a lesser volume like he maybe probably but why would we tell him to not do what he's doing go for it have fun it's a good point you raised there about like uh going on how you feel because that's a that's a good thing to think about because like if you go on oh i'm you almost have to if you plan to do this because i'm thinking about this for myself because i'm i'm i've been really kind of haphazard in my training over the last few weeks because i've been for various reasons kind of personal commitments i did a i did like a someone videoed me doing like a whole big five in the local gym recently which was really funny because people just staring at me like who does this guy think he is you know i'm getting filmed doing a workout like i'm some kind of like fitness model or something um (laughs) (laughs) which was quite entertaining but like you know that kind of i know this sounds silly but that kind of threw off my program a little bit uh and i just need to get i need to i want to whilst it may not even matter i'm digressing a bit here but whilst it might not even matter to for me at the point in my training to be all rigid and structured and uh, track things i like to do that that's just my personality type so i want to get back into a place very soon probably straight after the conference where um i'm training kind of twice a week probably doing a body weight session one day and then a a machine-based workout on the other um and drew bay is actually helping me out with some of that and but what i'm thinking for me would what would what re- work really well is to perhaps do okay i'm going to do eight or ten weeks on and then do this actual experiment and do two weeks off um i don't have a bob pod locally so i might have to rely on calipers or some other rudimentary method to measure body fat and lean mass but like i just wonder like so where i'm going with this question is for some, I mean, we're probably really splitting hairs now because for someone like me and maybe you, uh, we probably maxed out most of our gains. But sure. is there, do you think there's potential utility for people at our stage who are looking to get what they can in actually introducing these rest periods at these kind of intervals? And maybe that's actually stopping some people from gaining extra muscle mass so they, they could achieve otherwise or they couldn't. I, I in, in my, yeah, short answer, yes. And slightly longer answer, that's what I've seen. Mm. And I'm again, I'm using impartial measurement tools. It's not like I can influence what the bod pod says. The only way I can influence what the bod pod says is through the variables that I talked about before with calibration, temperature of the room, and time of day. So I, again, have not seen anybody get worse by implementing that strategy. Um, now, again, they all have trainers they're on medx machines and they're going to failure and all, all of that kind of stuff so they those variables are controlled as well so th- if you deviate from that pattern how does it influence your outcomes i can't speak to that but in my context i have to absolutely say that in a trained individual plan time off is a good thing yeah i think that's really interesting i mean i might i might experiment myself and uh let you know how that uh you know how that turns out but that's cool what is there any anything else you you've um i mean obviously you've been tracking that and that's probably going to maybe inform some of your recommendations going forward um but is there any other findings you've had in the in your gym um that's kind of informed how you train your clients and optimize their, their results uh yeah so i there's a i think there's a difference in recovery and overcompensation so if you're trying to max out genetic potential and make significant muscular gains, you're going to be looking at maximizing your overcompensation between workouts, not necessarily just your recovery between workouts. And I think recovery is a lesser point than overcompensation, which might sound like a little bit of a, a duh moment. But if you work out on Monday of this week and that's your zero, and everybody knows the initial reaction from a workout is a slightly negative one. It doesn't really matter what your workout is. You've got a significant amount of energy going out. You're at negative one just for the sake of conversation. By all accounts and purposes, when you got back up to zero, you are recovered, right? So you could have a higher frequency uh, and ensure that you are recovered, but if your goal is to then put on mass or make a strength gain or whatever it is, 
overcompensation is a totally different ball game, and that's what people have to look at, not necessarily the recovery aspect, because that's the easy part. Bouncing back from the workout is the easy part. The harder part is the new stuff, and it becomes harder as you become more trained, and it becomes easier when you pay attention to all of the other details like sleep and nutrition and stuff like that. But recovery and overcompensation are two totally different things, and I think that is what influences these wacky bod pod readings and i think that's what happens when you build in extra time so you recover 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 stimulate 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 and then sit back and let the process happen and it's not like we choose to get benefit from these things you impart a stimulus and your body does what it does you can't get through a productive workout and go i don't i don't feel like actualizing the gain of that one this week i i think i'll just leave that one in the gym. That's not what happens. So I think we can interrupt the process and focus more on recovery than overcompensation. And those are two totally different things. This is interesting. Um, Cause I think like Doug, Doug McGuff and, and John Little would, would probably totally agree with this approach uh, and have seen it. I've heard both of them talk about this. Um, you know, Doug's famous for saying, you know, pick up a pound of ground meat from the, uh, from the grocery store and hold that up. And you know, that's, that's like the thing, think about how much the, how much energy and resource and time the body has to, uh, use in order to create that on the body. Um, and, 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 and again, like John's, uh, you know, when he's been on the show, he's talked about, you know, it took, you know, using their Bob Pop readings. I mean, I'm sure you guys go back and forth. Like he noticed it takes 10 days in some cases for people to, um, to recover from workouts or just uh, overcompensate. Um, yeah. But this is what, how do you reconcile this with like, um, I'm just really curious how you think about this. So, uh, I had James Steele on the podcast a while back. We talked about, um, some research that he peer reviewed, uh, with regard to advanced trainees and how increasing frequency, uh, might produce greater gains. Um, I guess that's not mutually exclusive to what you're saying because that could, you could train with high frequency for a long period of time and then still have this rest. Um, yeah, but well, how do you, I'm just curious. Like, what's your opinion on that that point of view in general? Do you think it's relevant? Do you think that actually no, most people aren't going to be able to do that? Like, what what do you think? I think it's relevant. I think all information is relevant, which is super cool, right? You take it all in and apply whatever you think is valid. That kind of thing. I have a couple of interesting thoughts about this, and I have thought about it a lot. And I, again, I I feel safe in discussing it because I, I have no perfect answers. I just have more questions and my questions have like a little bit of substance. So one of the things that, I mean, it gets talked about all the time is like the, the test, the population that's getting tested is an important one, obviously, but back to bod pod stuff, when you're comparing lesser frequencies to higher frequencies, but you don't take into consideration the timing of the test relative to the event I think you miss out on a whole bunch of potential to have skewed outcomes. So if we were to go, if you were to be fully recovered, let's say you just came back from vacation and you were two weeks off. We know you're, you're up to snuff. You went in the bod pod today and then you worked out and then you went in the bod pod again. And then you went in every day for two weeks. You'd see a pattern of, different readings you'd have a dip you'd have initially you'd have an artificial inflammation based high in your lean muscle mass readings because you got like the pump right and then you would have a leveling out effect you'd create a little bit of a negative situation and then you'd slowly taper back up to where you peaked at your overcompensation so if you take a group of people, and let's hypothetically say that we're comparing two sessions a week to three sessions a week, and the workouts are performed Monday, Wednesday, and for the three-session people, again, on Friday, but then testing for the start and the end of the trial is done on Saturdays. You have created, from my opinion and the data that I have, which is super cool because I can show where I've got this opinion from you're going to see an artificially elevated reading in the people that worked out on friday from inflammation they're 24 hours after their workout kind of thing and perhaps an artificial low of the people that trained on the wednesday and did their reading on a saturday too 
but you might see that both groups get stronger over that period of time. So if you don't extrapolate the testing and, and maybe not extrapolate, if you don't factor that into the testing, I think you can get artificial outcomes. Mm -hmm. And we like, I, I don't let, and I have to, when people come in to use our bog pod that aren't members at the gym, I have to have conversations with them about when did you last work out? When did you last eat? All of that kind of stuff, because it really influences the test, of course, right? You've got a, the testing environment is hugely important for extracting any kind of knowledge based opinion. Yeah, like meaningful data for them as well. You want to caveat yeah. everything, don't you? Sure. <laughs> and I always tell people, that, and it makes them scratch their head a little bit, and I'm not sure I even really understand the statement, but the next test is always the more important one. Because you take a, you take a reading of something, it's a snapshot of a moment in time from which you can make outcome-based decisions on to alter your course, make improvements, and then you implement for a period of time and test again. And now it's time for a quick break. This episode is brought to you by Health IQ, a life insurance company that helps health conscious people like runners, cyclists, weightlifters, high intensity training participants, and more get a lower rate on their life insurance. Go to healthiq.com forward slash C warrior to support the show and see if you qualify. If you take care of yourself, you do smart strength training, you eat well, and your life insurance company doesn't seem like they care, there's an answer for you. Health IQ actually gives savings to people who take care of themselves. About 56% of Health IQ customers say between 4 and 33% on their life insurance because of this. To see if you qualify, get your free quote today at healthiq.com forward slash Warrior, or mention a promo code Warrior when you talk to a Health IQ agent. And now back to the show. I had someone, we had someone, uh, I was talking to someone recently about uh, this type of stuff. They told me that they're... Um, their doctor said they had high cholesterol. So you can see where this is going. Um, and so they're off, they're off eggs, they're off, um, uh, butter, they're off all the good stuff, basically. And, uh, you know, they were, they were eating dry toast with egg whites. And, <laughs> oh, and um, I was like, I was like, and, and then like, you know, we had the conversation and, um, I, I kind of explained that like it's a snapshot in time, you know, you, you, really for that data to be meaningful, unless it was like ridiculously high on like, I suppose the LDL side, like it's probably not. And, you know, just for everyone listening, I know a doctor, I don't play one on the internet. It's just my opinion. <laughs> um, but, but like, unless it's like really, really high, it's not that meaningful, right? Because it's a snapshot in time. There's a number of events that could have occurred around that that caused you to have that reading. And yeah. it's only meaningful once you have several over a, a relatively short period of time. And it's just insane to me. Um, but it's just, that's just authority is truth, right? Not truth is the authority type of situation. Uh, but sorry, I, I buy it in just because I had to speak. No, but. that's good. And that's a really good segue into the fact that like the proximity to the test obviously is a humongous influence, right? So I don't know if his name's Keto Dave. Oh yeah. Yeah. I Dave Feldman, him. isn't it? Yeah. Oh yeah. my God. Yeah. That guy does cool stuff. So, you know, he's pretty much demonstrated that whatever you eat for three days before the test is going to influence the test like crazy. And it doesn't really matter what your dietary considerations are from an agnostic standpoint a snapshot of a moment in time of blood work is actually three days average before the test. So I'm not sure if this lean mass body composition data that I have from the bod pod can be extrapolated to something like a DEXA scan or um, ultrasound or anything like that, but I would suspect that it does. So I don't think that this is exclusive to bod pod readings. I think that if you worked out, and you were super relatively inflamed from said workout and did a DEXA scan, you could probably get a false reading as well. So even if you think a DEXA is more accurate than a bod pod, if you've got the same testing device, what are the influences of the implementation on the test? And if you don't have the same time between events and the test, how do you compare the groups and how do you make conclusive assumptions from that i there there might be somebody out there that has the answers i'm and I, that would be awesome but these are my questions i imagine the answer is you can't i that's what i think like because like, <laughs> like this is the thing like i i've realized how little i knew about 
and you probably know a lot more than me about exercise science and obviously speaking a lot to like uh james fisher and james Steele, and and more recently doug you know and he he was recently on the podcast talking about how important sample size is um because we're drawing outcomes from smaller samples where the outcomes are almost meaningless um to the most people um so now i i don't have the answer but like this is one of the problems of exercise science. And I've been guilty for ages of looking at studies and almost being like, well, that's conclusive when actually it's, you know, rarely is. And, and, and you need, you know, I needed to have somewhat of a skill set to actually interpret studies in a productive way, which I still probably don't have. <laughs> um, but I'm way better now than I was like a year ago, you know? Yeah. And I think a more accurate way of getting data from this stuff is to, I mean, we can't just rely on a, test at the start and a test at the end. Like, why don't we keep testing well after the end, right? That's what my assumption is from seeing the extra rest benefits in bod pod readings. What would happen if you let's, and we we're going to stick with two and three times a week, just because it's easy to do Monday, Wednesday and Monday, Wednesday, Friday. If you then test it on Saturday and then you test it again on Tuesday, and you test it again on Thursday, and you test it again on Saturday, but nothing happened in between then, what what would the readings look like? I feel like that would give us more actual information because there'd be less noise from the influence of the event. So the further away you are from the actual workout, I feel like you get more accurate data. Mm. And that kind of study stuff, we have all of that information for blood work and things like that, kidney functions, liver functions, all that kind of stuff. Like if you dig up really simple searches on that, you can see that seven days before um, a test can influence liver enzyme activity and kidney function and all that kind of stuff with exercise. So why would that not be the case for recovery and overcompensation? That's a very good point. It's interesting. It's really interesting. Do you want to, um, I'm just, I, I always forget sometimes that, you know, some of my listeners aren't going to know what the hell we're talking about when we're talking about things like <laughs> bod pods, and especially the new listeners. Do you want to just quickly uh, define a bod pod? And I, I always get really confused about how to try and describe the mechanism, how it actually measures lean mass. But do you want to, like, are you able to cover that off? I can give you like a really high level overview That's and fine. I That's might fine. butcher it. So I'll try and keep it a succinct uh as i can but basically a bod pod is a two-dimensional scale and it's going to differentiate between lean muscle mass and body fat composition but lean muscle mass is going to include fingernails hair um bones internal organs and all those kinds of things but for the most part we can assume that those things remain relatively constant and any kind of fluctuations are going to be actual muscle mass now, it could be influenced by food that you've got in your stomach, a full bladder, um, inflammation from a workout, inflammation from anything, in the inability to recover, all of that kind of stuff. So we try to replicate the testing event as best we can. But it's basically – and this is where I, I don't want to screw this up. But it is based on air – pressure. Yeah. It's, yeah, it is high pressure because I could get very corrected on this. And that would be good. Um, it's based on – air displacement uh, in a fixed chamber of air. So you basically get turned into a mass. You sit in a fixed chamber, science happens, and there's sensors everywhere, and it tells you your body fat and lean muscle mass. It's very similar to hydrostatic weighing, but instead of getting dunked in water, you displace air. Yeah. So it's three 40-second tests, and I think they call the, the technology air displacement plasmagraphy. Ah, I think that's, that sounds familiar. Yeah, It sounds familiar, but I also could be saying it wrong. But basically, it's a two-dimensional reading of your mass compared to a fixed volume of air in a pressurized sensor-driven tank. Yeah, it's uh, I've done it quite a few times. So you go in with some little speedos and nothing else, maybe a shower cap, you've got hair uh, yeah. and you sit inside this tiny chamber. That's basically room for one person to sit on a little chair in a chamber with a little window on it. Um, it's not the most sexiest thing in the world, but it's uh, nothing crazy happens. Um, you just sit there, you hear a little click, you know, 20 seconds later, you're out and you've got your readings, basically. Um, yeah, it's cool. 
But I'd say, um, I'd say most cities in Canada, America will probably have access to something like that for people. They might have, um, most people have to check into universities and things like that. We've had a yeah. clinic, it's like a metabolic clinic has just opened up not too far from where our facility is, but it's affiliated with the university. And most, most places have them available. Yeah, and there are there are some. Uh, it, it would it would seem like there's some better tools these days for measuring body fat than obviously like um, uh, typically like the electronic scales isn't very accurate at all. Um, but like uh, there's the is it the the scalp the scalp uh, which is like an a. That one's cool. Yes, yeah, so this is getting more popular now, and um, I've heard a few people in our community, you know. At, uh, sort of be uh, proponents for it which was interesting to see um so i've heard some good things about that but i would encourage the listeners if you if you're listening to this you're like right i really want to get some good like accurate data on where i'm at in terms of lean mass and body fat and um, do look at uh do look into bod pods or a dexa is like the gold standard isn't it which is yeah. D E X A or dxa i ne- can never remember um yeah. De- are, get you the info sorry Either or will get you the info. I can never remember either. I say DEXA, but it yeah, could be yeah. DEXA. But uh, I don't know what it costs in the US or, or Canada, but like in the UK, you're looking at about £65 for a DEXA if you can find one. Um, and Bob Paul's normally around £35, £40. So I guess you add 10, 20% on that, it's probably the similar price over where you are. So I imagine something like that. Yeah, we charge non members 59 And the last time, for, for the sake of, uh, I, I have this conversation quite often, but for the sake of proving how accurate our bod pod is relative to me, so my N equals one, I did a DEXA back in January of 2017 and then drove immediately to my gym and did a bod pod. And my bod pod was off less than 1%. I remember, I remember you saying that in, on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. So, That's accurate. That it that's super accurate for me. Um, you know, it could change with different composition gradings. I'm not ignorant to that fact, but I think if you calibrate your pod and you take care of it and there all the variables are controlled, it's it's just as accurate as a DEXA. And one of the cool parts about finding an accurate bod pod versus a DEXA scan is that there's no radiation. Like a DEXA is an X ray. Yeah. I'm I don't want to tell you that you, it's safe to use it as much as you want, but I think maybe you should not go in that once a month for 10 <laughs> years, but I don't know. Um, so if you have access to a bod pod and those people look after the testing environment, I think a bod pod's a really, really accurate way to go. Cool. Um, no, absolutely. I think, I think it's good to highlight it because I, I just wanted to underscore that because uh, I just think it's a great way for people to get good data on their progress uh, rather than relying on the scales because losing weight doesn't mean anything. You know, <laughs> not, not good if you're losing muscle tissue. Um, so I, I'd bear that in mind. Um, but before we go off this topic, uh, did you want to, I know you had some case studies, uh, some clients you wanted to share some stories on. I don't know if that's, if you've already covered that or if that's still relevant. So I can, and this could be, I know you do show notes and all that kind of stuff, and I could talk about numbers and give you dates, but would it be more pertinent to give you like actual visual data that like client ABC? Because I can, I can rifle off numbers, but that doesn't like, he was 144 pounds of lean on this day. And then he was 142 and then he was 145. Like it's just a lot of syllables and maybe not a lot of action. Yeah, uh, yeah. If you if they're happy, then just ping it over to me, and I can add it in the show notes quite easily. Yeah, and just in conversation, the, the one of the coolest parts about this is that these are people that, um, you know, bodybuilding or athletic performance is not their main. It's not their job or anything like that, right? Like these are people that are interested in health and human performance from a day to day perspective. And you know, we've got an average age of people that I'm talking about of 53. And like a couple of these people, one of the most recent ones that kind of sparked this conversation between you and I, he just turned 68 and, you know, he's been training with me for three years and this guy's put on three pounds of muscle in the last year. And we didn't realize how much rest he might've needed until we started doing more frequent testing. And that's when it really started to launch off. So I'll, um, these guys have all given me permission to talk about them. 
So I can give you the data and you can put that in the show notes for sure. It's a little bit more impressive. How, how is that? Yeah, no, let's do that. How is that? So that chap you just mentioned who's 68, how is this finding informed how you train with him moving forward? Yeah. So I, I'm definitely going to be suggesting he's, he's, he is all in when he trains. So even if he is only recovered every single time, He's not leaving anything on the table. So if he needs an extra 10 seconds to best the last session or it's an extra two pounds and he's trying to match what he did last time instead of in in reference to time under load, he's going to dig deep and go for it. So if we don't pay attention to composition outcomes like bod pod readings, um, he might not actualize the goals that he wants to. Now, if his goal is just to keep his strength and maintain his strength and all that kind of stuff, that's fine. But a gigantic majority of the medical community think and are of the opinion of the fact that as we age, we lose muscle mass. I have started to, I, I want to say understand, but that's a little bit presumptuous. I've started to think that that is complete and utter garbage. I don't think that that is a destiny we need to succumb to. I think with adequate nutrition and not even proper adequate nutrition and proper stimulus matched with proper recovery, I think you can do the polar opposite of that. I think you can gain muscle when you're 80 years old. And I think that because I have impartial data for it. So with that particular guy, he loves the data just as much as I do. And you can probably appreciate this too. That can be a sickness just as much as it can be a benefit. So I think that's going to make him a little bit more receptive to, hey, it's been 13 weeks in a row. That leg press felt like I was lifting my house. I think I'll take next week off and I'll just go for a walk in my normal scheduled time instead of come down. And we know that that's not going to be a bad thing. Mm -hmm. It's probably going to be a good thing. So it's going to be goal dependent for sure. But if he's trying to put on five pounds of muscle at 70 years old, we would think that he would probably want to build in some, and that's a lot. That's a number that I just picked off the top of my head. It might not be possible. All <laughs> of that's right. That's just a number. But I think he will look at it a little bit differently now too. Um, and that's something that I can say a hundred times to a client, but it's going to resonate more when they see it from a bod pod reading perspective, rather than just listening to me parrot this stuff off all the time. No, it's cool. And I like that we did this, you know, uh, created a, a focused uh, episode on this discovery uh, and got quite into it because I think it's just really interesting. Um, I think actually this is going to be a bit of a controversial thing to say, but I think what's happening in the the exercise facilities is at the gyms is more interesting what's happening in the science right now. <laughs> um Uh, But that's where a lot of, you know, we don't have to wait for the science to tell us what to do. We can just experiment. And that's what's quite exciting. It's the most fun, right? Mm -hmm. It's the most fun. And it's the thing that motivates you to try new stuff too, like experimenting, furthers opinions and all that kind of stuff. And I, you know, I can't force anybody to do anything, but when you have N equals one data for them, the two of you can make some pretty cool decisions on how to march forward. Just when I have these conversations, it kind of upsets me because it makes you realize like how much I'd, I'd want to be, you know, cause if I told you before, like if I lived in your, near your place, I would sign up and train with you like without question, you know, and I would be your biggest keener, you know, <laughs> but, like, yeah, but, uh, <laughs> but, but then, you know, the only option I have then, and listeners probably sick of me saying is, is starting something in my local area at some point or wherever I end up. And that's kind of to be confirmed, but like, right. But yeah, it's uh, it's kind of inspiring and also annoying at the same time. You know? <laughs> I get that. I get that. And I get, um, you know, I've got, I have staff and I'm fortunate to have staff and all that kind of stuff. But I get into the same situation where it's like, oh, I wish all of my mentors lived here. Because how much more motivated would you be, right? Like you can, you still do your training and you put your all into it and all that kind of stuff and you're by yourself. And then you say that, it'd be more fun and more productive potentially to be around people with shared interests. Like I think like that all the time, which is why I'm so 
annoying with the people that are generous enough to give me their email addresses and pestering them and hey what do you think about this let's talk about luke on like a daily basis not daily but probably (laughs) more so than he wants me to (laughs) he's good about it though he's he hasn't told me off yet yeah i just came off a call with uh, jim flanagan for uh, part part two with him which was unbelievable like uh, it was really good like i know that sounds really like arrogant but obviously he made it um and we just got into like you i think you'd really enjoy it we talked about um the exercise equipment industry we talked about um his training regimen um mostly actually focused on the equipment side of things oh actually and running a business um so that was cool guy. yeah you've met oh. jim have you Oh, I, I've, I met him last year at Luke's conference, but I spoke to him when I first opened my facility. John knows him. John got me in contact with him and he helped me organize getting my first big five from MedEx. And that was eight years ago almost, which is pretty crazy. I met him for the first time and I spoke to him a couple of times on the phone, but that was again, seven or eight years ago. And he gave me lots of good advice. It was super motivational, all that kind of stuff. Luke introduced me to him last year on day one of the conference, and Jim recognized my name, recalled the conversation, asked if I still had the five machines. Hmm. Who the heck does that? I don't know what I had for breakfast last week. That's insane. Yeah, that's pretty impressive recall. That's strength training. He's a cool guy. Strength strength training and cognitive health right there. There you go, right there. (laughs) Proof's in the pudding. (laughs) <laughs> cool all right um is there anything else i was going to wrap up is there anything else you want to leave the listeners with before we uh oh and also the best way for people to find out more about you as well Blair. yeah medxpf.com is our website we've got a twitter page that i'm pretty active on i think it's i believe it's at medx fitness i don't pay a whole bunch of attention to the facebook page to be honest with you and it's noise yeah it's noise it's all just noise right, and you got to run your business I think that's it. Cool. Well, yeah, and your websites, I love your website because it's very, uh, I think you've updated it since I, because I, well, updated it since I checked it last um, because I checked it today and it just looked very clean and elegant. I like it. It's very minimalist. I'll pass um, that on to my marketing guy. He's a wizard. Yeah. And uh, and obviously all the things. So what I know is, is you link out all your social media from the website. So if people go to the show notes for this, uh, they'll be able to find the all the other domains where you're located. Um, and for everyone listening, to find the show notes for this particular episode, please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash Blair. Uh, and if you want to get access to all episodes, please go to corporatewarrior.org where you'll find a full list. And until next time, guys, thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Before you head off, head on over to corpwarrior.com, that's C-O-R-P warrior.com, to get your free high-intensity training Google progress chart and ebook with six interview transcripts with some of my top guests, including Dr. Doug McGuff, Drew Bay, and Bill De Simone on how to optimize muscle gain, fat loss, and overall health in an efficient, effective, and sustainable way. These transcripts are deliberately not verbatim. Instead, they've been transcribed in an easy read format to make it more enjoyable and easier for you to quickly pick out what you need and start getting results to get your ebook head on over to corpwarrior.com enter your email address then check your email for an email from me with a confirmation link once you click the link you will be instantly redirected to a pdf version of the transcripts This podcast is brought to you by HitUni.com. HitUni.com are a provider of amazing online courses for high-intensity training qualifications. HitUni comes highly recommended by the best in the field, including Body by Science co-author Dr. Doug McGuff, Discover Strength CEO Luke Carlson, and trainer and founder of Bay.com, Drew Bay. It was founded by my friend, author, and longtime personal trainer, Simon Shawcross, who's also been a guest on the podcast. Simon has 15 years' experience training clients and is supervisor of a 15 15,000 high intensity training workouts. Using knowledge from experts like Skylar Tanner, Dr. James Steele, Dr. Ellington Darden, Hit Uni is a goldmine for learning everything to do with high intensity training. The courses are delivered online through the website where you can learn via a variety of multimedia materials at your own pace. There's online support and a discussion forum where you can share ideas and ask for help. 
to learn more about high intensity training and improve my own results, I started their personal trainer course. The content is amazing, the courses are really easy to follow, and each section is organized into bite sized chunks that give you a real sense of achievement after you complete each one. I should also mention there is a DIY course. So, this is the course for you if you're not necessarily a personal trainer, but you want to learn more about high intensity training and how to implement it for maximum benefit in your own exercise regime. To get your exclusive Corporate Warrior 10% discount on any course you purchase, simply head on over to hituni.com, that's H I T uni, U N I.com, and enter the coupon code CW10, that's CW and the number 10. So, again, head on over to hituni.com. Pick your course and enter the coupon code CW10 for 10% discount. Thank you for your support.